we hope Vint Surf is still with us. Vint, are you still, are you here? Can you hear us there? I'm absolutely. All right. Can you tell us where you are? Because we weren't, we were just debating over dinner where you are. <laughs> I'm actually sitting in the kitchen of my home in McLean, Virginia. Okay, so it's not too early. It's about 10 o'clock, my guess, right? Yes, that's right. In the morning for me and, uh, and late in the evening for you. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we'll start the, the evening tonight. It's a conversation with the two, one of the two, found, uh, two founding fathers of, of the Internet. Of course, the Internet, we know, as it is today, is a process. And there were very, very many individuals involved, but these are the two prominent individuals here with us. Gentlemen, I, I pose this question. I know you probably have been asked this question many, many times before, but say for the benefit of all of us here, when, when you started work on the Internet, linking the computers together, did you ever envisage what we have today when you started? Any of you two, please, just please cherish your Well, let, let, it, I'd like to jump in for just one second and say that uh, Steve Crocker has the uh, unique... Uh, uh, responsibility for having begun work before the internet uh, on the predecessor, ARPANET. And I think his ambitions at the time were mostly focused on getting computers to communicate with each other. What we discovered, especially as the internet unfolded uh, starting in 1973, and uh, when the World Wide Web arrived, uh, around 1991 from um, Tim Berners-Lee that we actually had a system that connected people together uh, perhaps more importantly than just connecting computers to each other maybe Steve uh, can respond but I can tell you that we had some idea of what might happen but the world as it now appears with some three billion people connected is not one that I personally envisaged 40 years ago. Thank you. Steve? Yeah. Um, sometimes I give a, uh, a humorous answer about uh, you know, being able to see everything and that everything's unfolding exactly on the schedule that we had laid out. Um, but let me, let me give a, a bit more serious answer. We had the extraordinary good fortune of uh, building this network in an environment where there was already research going on in other activities related to computers. So we could see the future. Uh, there was a laboratory where the mouse had been invented and was already in use. A hypertext was in use. Uh, fancy graphics uh, were in use. Uh, large data stores, at least large by comparison with uh, what was available elsewhere. So uh, they weren't available in stores, they weren't available at consumer prices, but the concepts were working, and, uh, w and if you lived in that environment, you actually, without even thinking about it, were living in an environment that would unfold in a commercial sense over the next several decades. So um, t much of what we have today at least in the technology sense, is what we were able to see back then. Uh, and so it was very quickly obvious that we were going to have computers connected, that a, that a computer that was not connected to other computers was simply not going to be uh, interesting or going to survive. What I didn't see and what, uh, what I think Vint is saying and didn't see is the, the effect after that of having computers that were extremely inexpensive and hence ubiquitous. And so we could see, I could see, I could say, uh, every business, every university would be connected. What I didn't see was that my grandmother and grandfather or that my grandchildren would, uh, or that b children before they could speak would be using tablets because they could uh, make it work. Uh, and so that impact of having basically everybody you know uh, connected, having every form you fill out asking for your email address was just a little bit beyond the visions that we had 40 years ago. You know, when, so when I wonder, I wonder if I could uh, jump in for one more second, please. Something very strange happened in the late 70s uh, and early 80s, and that was the arrival of the personal computer. And what I found rather surprising is that those devices were designed 
to be used independently and not connected to anything. So what is peculiar, of course, is that eventually when they became part of the network environment, they were the primary tools for making the Internet a useful uh, system. Before the advent of the personal computer, we were using large-scale time-shared machines, time-sharing having been invented in the 1960s. So during the ARPANET period, most of the machines we were using were large-scale time-shared machines used by many people. So the, the advent of personal computer, which was intended to be for personal disconnected use, became the primary tool for connected communication. And that's what I'm using today. It's a laptop sitting in front of me. But, but when you look back, I mean, what both of you started working on and others as well, of course, actually changed the lives of billions. I mean, certainly, I, I mean, we do things because we want, to, we want to make a difference, say. I mean, would that, I'm not sure that ever imagined in, entered your mind. Uh, billions did not enter my mind. <laughs> then, uh, it's, well, you know, I, the result, of course, is clear. Many, many billions of people's lives have been changed, whether they are active online users or maybe only uh, the uh, beneficiaries of side effects of other people's use. But that wasn't what motivated me anyway. I think what motivated me was the sheer fascination of making things connect to each other that hadn't been connected before, of doing something in one place and having an effect show up thousands of miles away. Uh, that was the ultimate you know, beguiling aspect of computer networking. The idea that we would change everybody's lives wasn't the motivator for me, although I've frankly been watching and benefiting from the effects, uh, but that is not the thing that drove my interest. What was your motivation, Steve? Um, I, too, was uh, fascinated by the idea that you could connect um, computers and that you could get the benefit of disparate computers working together, that specialized capabilities in one place could be combined with specialized capabilities in another place. Um, my own focus at the time was in another area, and, and uh, I was quite interested in artificial intelligence in how to make computers smart and how to understand uh, the complexities of the human mind. I had had uh, quite a bit of experience programming and working at the systems level with computers. And so when this project came along, uh, I was drawn into it as uh, with the mindset that this would be something relatively quick. We'll just take care of connecting these computers together and then we'll get back <laughs> to doing serious research. Um, and, and in fact, I, um, I, you know, I was sort of full of myself as a young man. I, I would, uh, I would kind of sneer that this network only had socially redeeming uh, 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 utility, that it didn't actually have any real content, any depth to it as a research topic, uh, but it was a necessary kind of a task. We'll just get on and do it, and then we'll move on to something else. <laughs> What, what were you thinking when, when the internet really took on and then suddenly you saw the advent of, of eventually like social media? We had high five, we've got Facebook now and, and people are interacting and, and, and what's happening now as we all know, it's, it's people being able to express a view, people are able to sort of come together in clusters and groups. Ideas can develop and evolve and actually put pressure on things and, and maybe cause things to change. We, we saw, uh, frankly, in the development of the network itself, the network effect of bringing people together. Uh, the ability for people to write something and somebody else would respond to it, even though it was clumsy in a sense. Um, we saw that effect right immediately. And then uh, there were a number of everybody who was involved, I think, has his own personal uh, story about where the interesting mark points are along the way. I'll tell you two, uh, and then I'll let Vint uh, dominate the rest of the time. Um, in, 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 in the early 1970s, I worked at DARPA in, the, in Washington, and I introduced two Air Force captains to each other, one from Alabama and one from New York. Now, the U.S. military has its own communication systems, including um, telephone systems, so that you can call just like an internal, it's like sure. a big enterprise. 
These two Air Force captains, when I introduced them to each other, exchanged their email addresses instead of their Autobahn telephone numbers. And I thought, we got it. We, th that was a moment <laughs> in which I knew that the impact was there, that at that level, uh, these are junior officers, um, understood that that was a preferred mode of communication and it was without prompting for me. Uh, a much more personal story. Um, when I uh, met my wife, uh, she's from a medical family. Her father uh, was a well-known professor of medicine. And uh, her parents were a little surprised that she would be interested in somebody who was not a doctor. And she tried to explain to them what this network stuff was that right. I was working on. And they, had, they couldn't make any sense out of it all. Um, some years later, after we were married, uh, my wife took ill and we moved rather quickly overnight back into her parents' house so they could manage her medical care. And I, at that time, was a director of a laboratory and I had people working for me and I wanted to continue to manage at a distance. And so I borrowed a terminal and I brought it into the house. Mm -hmm. And in the sole single confrontation that I've ever had with my mother-in-law in 40 years, she said, there's no room for that in this house. And I had to drag it back down the stairs and out the car and make some other arrangements. Time passes, and uh, uh, we eventually got her a laptop. And uh, she was running a business out of her house. And she took great delight in stealing the Wi-Fi signals from her neighbor's house. And my stock has gone up gradually over time. So, uh, Vint, any, any thoughts, please? That, well, I'm still recovering from that wonderful story. Um, a couple of observations. First of all, uh, in the uh, earlier days, during the ARPANET period, uh, even before, uh, or maybe about the time that Steve went to DARPA, uh, we uh, encountered an application called Electronic Mail. Um, this uh, became visible to all of us and used by all of us in the 1971 period very, very quickly. Uh, after that was uh, unleashed, we saw the creation of distribution lists on email. And the first two uh, were called sci-fi lovers for people that like reading science fiction. And the other one was called Yum Yum, which is about uh, restaurant reviews in the Palo Alto area near Stanford University. Uh, the point is that both of those were social networks for all practical purposes for people interested in some particular topic. So 40 years ago, we were seeing some of the social effects of being able to link people together through networks and to allow people to discover each other uh, solely because they had a common interest, not because they knew who uh, each person was uh, at the outset. So that's the first point. Second point, uh, I wanted to emphasize and congratulate everyone on the uh, anniversary, 25th anniversary of the founding of uh, the .th top level domain and point out to you that that was 1988. That's only five years after the internet was turned on in 1983. What that says is that Thailand has been participant in this internet story from a very, very early stage with regard to its operational uh, ability. Uh, and I'm very excited about that. And I've just been reading about the IP version 6 initiatives that the Thai government is undertaking. Uh, to make sure that uh, there are some 300,000 free Wi-Fi access points around the country, that uh, students will have access to uh, tablets. Uh, it looks to me as if Thailand has become an extremely vigorous uh, uh, user uh, of Internet and a developer of infrastructure, and, and that's much to be celebrated. Thank you. I was just one, just a curious question with, with all the social media, just to follow on about that. Do you communicate using social media as well? We're doing it right uh, now. You I just can't see it. <laughs> Personally. Yeah, this is called, this is called Google Hangout, uh, and it is part of our Google Plus social medium. Uh, it's becoming extremely useful, not only for this kind of a situation uh, or uh, perhaps uh, private interests and things, but we use it a great deal at Google for business purposes. Uh, small groups of uh, you know, up to 10 to 12 people or more uh, can convene very, very quickly. I mean, it took literally seconds to set up uh, this particular video conference, as opposed to having three engineers around trying to make sure that the audio and the video were all functioning. So this casual ability 
to communicate in groups in this fashion is an extremely powerful enabler. And I know that uh, in Thailand, as bandwidths go up, uh, that this will be uh, used as a tool as well, I'm sure. Uh, just to continue on then, with, with regard to the internet, uh, I, I remember I asked Steve this yesterday when we had a short conversation. Where do you see the future going, and where will the internet be? And I remember you said at, some, at one point you said it would disappear. And could you explain and maybe elaborate to everybody what you mean by that? And Vin, after that, please. Yeah, it'll be interesting to hear uh, Vince's uh, reaction, which is uh, he's very deeply embedded in the in the making the future happen. Um, so I think I said uh, a couple of things. One was that I think the internet will become not only ubiquitous, but um, not the focus of attention. It will simply become part of the underneath uh, girding of everything we do, and that people will stop talking about being on the internet. Uh, you'll stop thinking about uh, whether you're on or off the internet. It'll just be part of everything. So it'll be like internet inside. And uh, uh, I think the words I used would, it, it would submerge. It will become embedded. Um, and that our attention will be focused in other aspects of this. Uh, the other thing which, uh, you know, go back to what Vint was talking about, about the rise of personal computers, um, there's an interplay between the uh, increase in the technology that we have available and the uh, decrease in the size, and all of that makes it much more usable on a personal basis. The next steps somewhere along the way, in my view, will be uh, voice interaction, which happens a little bit today, but I'm talking about as natural as you and I are talking back and forth. So that imagine that you could have something that is live and available to you that's sitting notionally on your shoulder and you can just sort of talk to it. Um, and, and it's there for you. Now, it might be there for the government to spy on you, and that's a whole other discussion and so forth. But anyway, um, imagine, imagine that you have that kind of facility and that it is just always with you and available for whatever you want to do. That will be another big game changer in my view. Vin, could we have your views, please? Well, what you're seeing right now, I hope, is that I'm wearing something called Google Glass. And this is an example of what Steve is talking about. Uh, for all practical purposes, this is a device which is as powerful as a mobile. Uh, it accepts voice commands. Uh, it accepts uh, gestures along what would be a touchpad over here. It will accept um, uh, a request to take images, to uh, record a video, to send an email, to get directions for uh, moving, driving from one place, or walking, or bicycling. Uh, the whole idea here is that the computing capability and the communications capability are, as Steve says, completely submerged. And your focus of attention is on what does this device do for you. And in the same way that the laptop, once it's been connected to the internet, the internet part is, is almost, uh, un, you know, it's invisible. Uh, what's important is the application. And a man named Mark Weiser, who uh, was at Xerox Park, coined the term ubiquitous computing and what he meant by that is that it, the computing would just sort of submerge into everything, into the appliances around us, into the buildings that we live in, the automobiles that we drive, the clothing that we wear, uh, the things like this that we wear. All of that will have computing capability, but we won't think of them as computers. We'll think of them as devices that we use and that are of use uh, to us. And I think this is a very uh, reasonable projection of even the near-term future. One of the reasons it's so important that uh, Thailand is focusing on getting IP version 6 uh, implemented is that the address space is vast. It's capable of supporting something like 340 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses, which is what we will need when literally billions, many tens of billions of devices are part of this network environment. So I agree with Steve's assessment that we will not think about networking anymore. We will think about things that, that uh, are of use to us that just happen to be enabled by the internet. Just, just a quick question, if I may. I mean, I asked Steve this yesterday with, with as, you, as the internet becomes submerged, as you say, we have access, it's, and it's not just through a personal computer. 
with regards to news and information. I asked this about it yesterday, and increasingly in the West, the, the, the role of newspapers, for example, is declining pretty rapidly, and they get, people get information online. And how do you see that future? <laughs> So what I said yesterday when you said, uh, 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 what's the future of newspapers, I said, what's that? Yeah, I know. You were talking about a bunch of journalists. <laughs> um, so, actually, go ahead, Steve. Well, um, the, the, the need for collecting information, uh, gathering it and filtering it, and packaging it for others to use, and having some taste and judgment about what's relevant, I think those fundamental functions of reporting and editing uh, will in some fashion continue. Right. Now, th there are many, many options for how to do that. Uh, and the current model of having sort of large businesses and very formal structures with the news organizations is currently under challenge, of course, and that's what the, uh, the news conference focused on Correct. a lot. And uh, there's no news in that. No. Uh, but, uh, but the fundamental requirement of how do you manage the enormous amount of information out there and having people who are good at finding what's relevant, having people who are good at finding uh, how to aggregate it, how to package it, uh, and, and is a service to each and every one of us as a consumer. And I think those kind of fundamentals, one fashion or another, will have to continue. Right. How much of that is done by big organizations? How much is done by uh, freelance individuals? How much of that is done by smart machines that are doing those services? I think all of that is going to play out in a very interesting way that is very hard to predict. Right. Vint, any thoughts on that, please? Well, I think the term newspaper uh, tells you a lot right away. Uh, the first observation is that there was a time when paper was the cheapest and fastest way to get a lot of information out to many people on a regular basis. And because it was an inexpensive way to do that and people were interested in what's new, they were also tolerant of having advertising adjacent to the newspaper stories. Uh, and that, of course, paid for the enterprise. Uh, it's my belief, I think Steve would share this, that high quality journalism is very, very important to democratic societies. And so we uh, all uh, seriously need to find ways of recasting the business model that supported the notion of newspaper, only now it's going to have to be the delivery of news uh, with good quality uh, journalism, both editing and investigative reporting. Uh, whether that's done as Steve uh, asks, uh, in large-scale enterprises or by some other means is an open question. But I think the importance is so high that uh, many of us, including uh, me and Google, will be very interested in finding ways to facilitate that high-quality journalism uh, as the future unfolds. The, the Internet has, has changed people's lives, but they're, 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 and there are a lot of positives that you must have, there are negatives as well, the way it's used, how people have used it, and, and especially in the social media. Do you have any areas of concern currently in the past or, or in the future? Vint or Steve, please. I'll let Vint go. Well, let me start out by saying that uh, one of the disappointing things about creating large-scale infrastructure is that people can abuse it. Uh, when we began this work, uh, there was a fairly homogeneous collection of engineers whose interests were reflected in many of the applications that uh, emerged out of the ARPANET and the Internet experience. But as the general public got access to it, beginning in 1988 or 89 or so, at least in the U.S., um, we began to see people abusing the system. Uh, the problem here is that uh, People, uh, not everyone has everyone else's best interests uh, in mind. And so there is abuse on the network, and we do have to do something about it. Uh, the, one of the challenges is that the abuser may be in one uh, legal jurisdiction and the victim in another. And this could cross uh, international boundaries as well. So we're going to have to seek uh, common agreement uh, on an international basis as to what constitutes abuse, what is unacceptable socially, and what we should do about it. Uh, passing laws often is ineffective, especially if they can't be enforced. And so we may have to uh, make use of uh, additional methods 
for uh, persuading people not to do things that are harmful. Uh, one of the obvious things is moral suasion. You just say, don't do that. It's just wrong. Uh, another possibility is to say, well, we can't stop everyone from doing some of these things, but if we catch you doing it, and we've all agreed that it's socially unacceptable, then there have to be consequences. So we will have to deal with this technology as we have with others. Uh, to give you an example, uh, certainly in the U.S., and I presume in Thailand, it's considered illegal to drink alcohol and then drive, uh, and cause damage, harm, possible death. Uh, we can't stop people from doing that, but we can tell them that if we catch them doing that, there will be consequences. There may be fines, or maybe you might be put in jail, you might lose your driver's license. So we have to employ uh, both social and legal methods in order to minimize or reduce the level of abuse. And I think the same kinds of things will probably uh, factor into the way we deal with uh, the Internet. So, yeah. Uh, let me, uh, at the risk of uh, going a little too abstract, uh, stand back and take a very long view of this. Uh, I recently read a, uh, a book by Jared Diamond on the world until yesterday, uh, talking about the, um, what society looked like prior to the formation of nation states, uh, tribe, tribes and chiefdoms and small, right. uh, small organizations. One of the uh, most important points that he makes with an enormous amount of data is uh, the whole theme of risk reduction. And uh, what, how each of those societies dealt with a variety of different risks, from from uh, risk of not having enough food to risks of war and so forth, and the transition into the nation states uh, uh, had a dramatic impact on reducing the uh, the risks that societies face, even including the risks of a loss of life due to war that as horrendous as the massive large-scale wars that we've observed in the last century or so, they are relatively small from a percentage uh, impact point of view compared to the uh, near state of total warfare that existed on a continuous basis right. in the forehead. So if you, if you look at this very broad arc, and I'm talking about you know, looking at a very big picture here, of the, the evolution in societies as focused on how do you reduce risk, and then you look at the specifics of the creation of institutions and the development of technology and so forth. You have um, modern mechanisms. You have law enforcement. You have uh, the rise of the state so that it has supreme power uh, rather than having everybody take the law into their own hands. You have on the, on the commercial side, you have the creation of insurance as a way of transferring risk. You have commodity markets in the, in the marketplace to transfer certain kinds of risks. Uh, we are in a transition period with respect to the introduction of the Internet technology. It is challenging uh, some of the boundaries that we've set up. It is challenging the, the effectiveness of some of the mechanisms that we have available in society. And at the same time, it is stimulating the thought process for how do we go beyond what we currently have. So as Vint alluded, we're going to have to have laws. They're going to have to be uh, cross-border laws. But there's also an enforcement problem. And there is, uh, more deeply than just passing laws, the development of um, new uh, standards that everyone learns from birth about how to behave, what the moral norms are, and uh, development of those uh, gradual shifts. Where all that winds up is extremely hard to predict. But I'm pretty sure that, as I say, we're in a transition period of now that we've got the new technology and now that it's causing both positives and negatives, of resetting where those boundaries are, of figuring out how do we make the adjustments to have the benefits and at the same time reduce the risks that we've encountered. But when you say we're in so a transition... I wonder, yes, Ben, please. I, I just wonder if I could amplify on this. It's a beautiful theme that Steve has introduced. There are two things to observe. One of them is that uh, new technologies uh, often precede the development of social norms and conventions that make the technology comfortable for people to use. When brownie cameras were introduced in the early 20th century, people were shocked that anyone would take a photograph of someone at the beach. Uh, you remember uh, beach attire at that time was, for all practical purposes, like wearing full clothing. 
and yet people were very disturbed by the fact that someone could take a photograph. Well, eventually we uh, evolved practices to deal with that uh, concern. Uh, the other point that I want to make is that uh, Steve mentions the nation state. Uh, one of our colleagues, uh, uh, Bertrand de la Chapelle, uh, who is uh, French and a member of the board of ICANN uh, that Steve chairs, uh, has brought up a very interesting post Westphalian notion. Now, we all remember the Treaty of Westphalia was in 1648, and it created the notion of nation state. It created the notion of sovereignty, and it allowed uh, states to be so sovereign within their boundaries. What Bertrand tells us is that the internet creates a kind of post-Westphalian need for nation states to recognize that they do not and cannot exercise full sovereignty if there are things that happen in the state that affect others. So an example uh, in the physical world would be a river flowing from one country to another. If uh, country A pollutes the river just before it goes into country B, it has an impact on country B. We can't allow country A to treat that as a purely sovereign act. And the internet introduces a similar kind of problem because acts in one country have potentially harmful effects on others in other countries. So we're going to have to cope with a post-Westphalian uh, view of the way our world functions. So, so let me, let me, let me uh, go a bit further. You have to observe that what you've just seen here are two computer scientists using words like Westphalian and post-Westphalian. One of the impacts of the uh, network is to highlight and uh, uh, focus attention on disadvantaged minorities. Just consider the impact on the disadvantaged minority of the class of people we call political scientists who now are shaking in their boots that computer scientists are using terms like Westphalia. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to follow on, you, as Steve, you mentioned a minute ago, you were, we're in a transition. We're, 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 we've got a sort of, there are positives and there are negatives. There are governments who think they can control the use of the net and the information. When, when, when you can't control that technology, but then there are positives and misabuse, as you've said, with regards to the internet. Is there any possibility that sort of, sort of modes of conduct or some agreement can be reached? I mean, each government is not different. Each region is, not, is, is very different. Well, the, your, your last point, I think, is very important. Uh, it is not going to happen. It, it, it will happen. It will not happen uniformly. It will not happen all at once. Um, there will be um, regional and um, uh, co other kinds of coalitions of, uh, among countries that have uh, common trading uh, or other shared uh, purposes. And then in other parts of the world, uh, there will be different coalitions. There will be different arrangements. And so I think that we will see um, a mixture of uh, only slowly emerging global uh, norms and uh, changes, and more rapidly, but not rapidly in its in their own right, but uh, but but sort of as a pre precursor of global norms, will be uh, a faster rise of regional norms, which is perhaps a relevant comment for what we're doing right here, right now. Uh, this event that we're at, this is the joint gala of the 25th anniversary of .th and also the INET conference uh, here, brings together people not only from Thailand but from Southeast Asia and from the region in general. And uh, one of the effects that we've seen uh, very common throughout the internet is the rise of uh, regional aggregations um, and a lot of cross-border activity that it does not require getting on a plane and flying around the world uh, all the time, despite the fact that Vint and I do it all the time. Um, but it's much more efficient and much more effective to bring people together in a kind of an expanded neighborhood. Vint, any thoughts on that, please? Well, uh, you know, the Internet uh, has allowed information to flow remarkably freely all around the world. And, and you can imagine that uh, at Google, we are great believers in sharing of information for everyone's benefit. 
uh, and helping people discover information that's of use. Uh, my sense right now is that this global sharing and, and freedom of expression, the ability to invent new applications in a permissionless way, are all some of the most positive benefits that the Internet has brought. And although there are concerns at the government level and even at the individual level uh, about content on the net, I think that historically speaking, um, what everyone has benefited from almost uh, invariably is an, an open and free flow uh, of information. So I'm, I'm hoping that governments and citizens who are worried about content that they uh, consider uh, hazardous uh, will eventually be dealt with, not necessarily by suppression, but by people recognizing that it's in fact not useful information at all. This is called critical thinking, and one of the most important tools we have is to learn when and how to reject information which is not of any use. And my guess is that having several billion minds understand and reject bad information is a much more powerful tool than anything we could invent, either legally or technically. There's, there's also uh, this just going on about the growth of the internet and the access to the internet in some countries, obviously in developing countries. Uh, those who have access to it are those who can actually afford it, even though the, the, the PCs and the laptops are getting cheaper, smartphones and mobile phones are getting cheaper. It's still the, the, those who can afford it and the middle class who have it. Meanwhile, although, let's say, for example, in Thailand, the, the penetration of mobile phones is quite high but the level of smartphone usage is, is still low relative to that. But that then still creates a gap of knowledge and accessibility. Any thoughts on that? Will, will that eventually, I guess it depends on the state of the economy of each nation, will, will that gap eventually be reduced, do you think? I, I'm sure it will, actually. Um, you know, every country has uh, a range of uh, people at different economic situations. Uh, they have their own gaps independent of the internet in terms of um, uh, class and, and um, uh, income. Um, and gradually over time, one of the great th thrusts of history is to try to uh, reduce the, uh, the disadvantages at the lower end and try to, to bring a greater sense of equality and at the same time um, try to have enough incentive so that there's an engine that drives all of this. That's the, the grand tension about capitalism versus socialism and so forth. Um, and the internet I think is just sort of a small piece of that story. This gap that, that you've described existed in a much bigger sense at the very early days when a very, very few of us were privileged to have access to the network. And I can tell you that the people that we interacted with, we felt part of a very special uh, society. And the idea of being disconnected from that was not palatable at all. And there were people who were not, did not have access, but who understood it, mm -hmm. who kept knocking on the door saying, I want to get in. And, it, and it, it took a little while to be able to figure out how to open those doors and make the network as available as it is today. So it, again, taking the very broad look, uh, even though we're talking about a very large number of people, and even though it is now very visible, this digital divide, it is in some sense the last piece of this grand puzzle and is late in the evolution. And so I'm, I'm quite confident that, you know, over time, uh, a combination of technology and allocation of resources and focus of attention will, uh, will take care of that. Vint, any thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I absolutely endorse what Steve had just said. Uh, there, to use his uh, wonderful phrase, this grand arc of technology, uh, he seems to always take that which is expensive and bulky and transform it eventually into something that we can use personally. And so when we see the advent of the smartphone with computing power well beyond what Steve and I had as graduate students in the form of large time-sharing systems that had to be in air-conditioned rooms, what you see is this... Um, sort of steady transformation of expensive and big into inexpensive, small, and personal. So uh, we can anticipate uh, what the society is going to be like as more and more of these kinds of things become personally available. Think for a minute about one of the hottest topics today, the 3D printer. 
not everyone has these yet, but they will become increasingly available, and they'll be able to do more than just fabricate plastic material. I've even seen some printers that are used to fabricate food, if you can believe that. Although, personally, I'm, my reaction to eating a 3D printed meal is still some hesitation. But the idea is that ultimately all of these things will become available at reasonable cost. The mobile uh, smartphone is certainly demonstrating that. Uh, there are six and a half billion phones, mobile phones, available. Probably at least 30% or more of those are now smartphones. So I am uh, absolutely certain that this gap will go away. It just takes time as the costs come down. Can we just, just move to the role of the internet in education? Sure. I mean, it's revolutionized and, and, and given access to so many people who really didn't have the opportunity, and not only that, to governments, which, 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 which could, they could harness this use of this internet. Um, how do you feel about that? I mean, and how could it be better used in, in your view? I mean, I mean, this is a, it's a tough question, but you know, how, how could it be better used? There's a, a huge uh, number of efforts that have been put into building um, educational tools for people. Many of them are very limited in their scope and have not succeeded very much. Meanwhile, without trying very hard, uh, you have dramatic things like Google that have totally revolutionized access to information and hence have also revolutionized the learning process. Um, I, I, like most students in the U.S., uh, at a certain point in our education, we were ushered into the school library and we were taught how to use the tools to look something up in the card catalog and then to go to the shelf to find the book. Uh, to find things in magazines, we had to go to a periodical index and we had to look that up, a very laborious process. And we had to take notes on cards and we had to sort them and so forth. And uh, uh, we were subjected more than once through this rigorous process in order that we get good at using the library. It's hard to explain that notion to a, to a youngster today. They just say, well, what do you want to know? Type it in. That's right. And, uh, and the answer comes out. Um, and the access to uh, that knowledge base is a fundamental change in the educational process. It's not thought of quite that way. It hasn't gotten into the curriculum exactly, but every child who's growing up with access to the internet um, sort of instinctively goes to get information that way, and uh, it just changes uh, deeply the educational process. Vint, some thoughts? Uh, well, I thank, you, thank you, Steve, for uh, allowing me to jump in uh, with the MOOC uh, observation. This is the, the massive online open courseware that is becoming increasingly uh, available. Uh, I'm sure many of uh, the people in, in attendance tonight know the story about two of our Google colleagues who uh, decided to teach a class last year uh, in artificial intelligence, and they wanted to do it online. And they thought that maybe 500 people would sign up. And as it happened, 160,000 people signed up for the class. It was globally available. And of course, their reaction was, uh-oh, now what? Lots of work uh, proceeded to uh, write software to manage such a large-scale uh, student population. Since that time, classes as large as 300,000 people have been online. Not everyone graduates necessarily, but I think of the 160,000 people that took that artificial intelligence course, uh, at least 23,000 graduated. And I remember thinking, you know, if you had been teaching artificial intelligence for the last 30 years, you probably did not encounter 23,000 students over the course of that time. So in one class, they touched more people than anyone in the history of teaching artificial intelligence had ever touched. This is becoming increasingly popular and interesting. And the economics of it are dramatic. Let us imagine for a moment, you have a class of 100,000 students. They're all over the world. And you decide to charge them each $10 for taking this class. That's a $1 million class. I challenge you to find me any professor who's ever taught a class that he was able to charge a $1 million for. 
So the economics of this are dramatically different, and universities are going to have to understand how to adapt to this potential. I, my understanding is that uh, John Hennessy, the uh, president of Stanford University, is extremely enthusiastic about the evolution of this new technology. Thank you. Uh, just at this point, I was wondering if there are anybody in the audience, uh, we've been having this conversation, who'd like to, to ask some questions. Um, I don't know if we have microphones available, but is anyone uh, who would like to ask either Vint or Steve a question? Vince, anybody, please. I'll be happy to take questions afterwards for $10 a piece. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Ah, right there in the back, please. Um, we have a microphone, I hope, maybe. It's, it's on its way. Um. Might help to bring the house lights up a little bit. That's right. Thank you. If you could please identify yourself and ask the question. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Nitipong Bunlong. Uh, I work for DTAC, one of the mobile company in Thailand. Uh, this is uh, probably a question for Dr. Vincent Surf. Um, I see that you have a Google Glass on and just wondering how do you see the development of the Google Glass? Is it going to be like the next um, iPad devices or the next uh, smartphone? Do you see um, in that direction? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I see this as largely more like the mobile than anything else. Uh, this device is using, at the moment, a mobile for its communication, although it also it has Wi-Fi capability and it has Bluetooth capability. But the part that is most interesting to me uh, is that it has speech recognition capability, so I can tell it to do things. I can give you a small example on the spot, although you won't see the result right away. Uh, I'm tapping it. It says, OK, Glass, take a picture. And although you can't see this happening, it just took a photograph of the screen uh, that I'm looking at on my mobile, I'm down on my laptop. Uh, so the ability for the computer to participate in the same environment that I'm in, to hear my voice, to interpret it, uh, or to interpret uh, touches that I make in the same way that a touchpad would be used on a laptop means that I now have a hands-free access to the resources of the internet. And I have already found this extremely useful. I can see my email. I can respond to it by dictating answers. I, I can capture images that uh, will remind me of things that I've done during the day or things that I should do. Uh, this is just the beginning. There are only a couple thousand of these in use right now. We're hoping to get more of them out uh, on an experimental basis to allow people to evolve applications so that by the time this is a uh, commercial product in 2014, it will have a larger collection of applications for people to use. But even now, for navigation, communications, and capturing of uh, imagery and things of that sort, it's a very effective tool. Anybody else has a question? Yes, please. Don't move that. Hello, Vint. Uh, my name is Hugh Tawisa Konantakun. We met uh, about 12 years ago. Uh, my question to both of you, either of you can answer. Is it safe to use the internet in some countries? Is the big brother taking over and watch you when you are using the internet? Is your privacy lost when you are entering some country? As since Steve offers me the opportunity to respond, thank you very much, Steve. I appreciate that. Uh, look, and let me point out a couple of things. First of all, uh, it's clear that the Internet is a physical thing, and that it's possible to uh, have access to it and its contents. So the answer is yes, there is a potential loss of privacy. Uh, however, I'd like to point out to you that uh, we actually um, are destroying our own privacy quite independent of uh, 
of any government uh, involvement at all. Think for just a minute about people taking pictures, putting them up on you know Facebook or YouTube or Google Plus or uh, other uh, photo sharing uh, websites, and then someone else coming along and tagging the images, saying, "Oh, well, that's Steve Crocker or that's been served." And then someone else coming along, looking at these images, saying, oh, that's been searched, and he's at this place, and he told me he was somewhere else, and now I'm in trouble. Um, so th these actions that we take innocently actually erode our privacy, and we don't understand this because we haven't involved social conventions to, to deal with the problem. So although I understand and appreciate your concern about government intervention and Big Brother, I think that socially speaking, we have evolved a set of tools uh, and, and applications that actually erode our privacy because we don't understand what the side effects are of its use. So once again, we're back to this interesting question of evolving social conventions for uh, preserving what little privacy we still have. Um, and privacy is very important. People um, are very concerned about keeping uh, some information to themselves. Uh, as with all technologies, we have to sort of learn what the consequences are, and uh, it's uh, at some point it'll no longer be uh, satisfactory to, to express surprise when you do something in public and there's a picture taken, and that picture is then available to everybody, and you get outraged and say, uh, that shouldn't have happened, and the answer should be, well, you should have known that that was going to happen. Um, there is a flip side to all of this, which is we make extremely strong use of the promulgation of personal information for our own benefit. If you walk into a hotel that you have visited before and the concierge greets you by name and has your favorite drink waiting, um, is that a violation of privacy or is that high quality service? And, and in general, you have this whole tension between uh, what's known about you being used for your benefit versus what's known about you being used in ways that you might not be so comfortable. But in both cases, you have quite a bit of information about yourself that is known by other parties, by other people. Uh, finding the right balance, finding the right norms for all that is again a, an ongoing thing. I don't think there is going to be a single resting point. I don't think there is a notion of absolute privacy. And, um, uh, and on the other hand, uh, I think that we will establish some norms about what's proper and what's not proper. Can I, can I go on to the challenges you face now on the technical side with regards to ICANN and what you're doing? What, what, what do you see as, as the next step that you need to address main issues? Well, um, uh, th this one, I guess, is addressed to me since I'm currently the uh, chairman uh, of the board of ICANN. Following in Vint's footsteps, uh, who dragged me into this process some years ago, and Vint shared uh, very ably the, uh, the ICANN board. ICANN has a, an interesting role with respect to uh, the internet and with respect to internet governance. Um, we have a very, very narrow, very restricted mandate to oversee the unique identifiers, the domain name system, the uh, uh, addresses, and other identifiers that are important. We are, however, the only uh, structure, the only organization that is explicitly put together to do any kind of internet governance, per se, on a global basis. And so we get looked at as the organization for all things related to internet governance from time to time. A very heavy burden, right. one that we can't possibly uh, fulfill, nor should we. So um, one of the challenges will be uh, the creation uh, of other institutions and the cooperative ecosystem that has to come into existence already uh, in very strong measure does exist. Uh, one of the focal points of the Internet ecosystem is, in fact, the Internet Society, which sponsors INET. Um, the regional Internet registries that um, uh, oversee the address allocations within each region. The country code top-level domains like, like .th, like the THNIC. Um, so there is an ecosystem, but it's going to have to expand to include other things, law enforcement and, and uh, commercial codes and so forth. Um, Within ICANN, we currently are expanding the number of uh, what are called generic top-level domains. Uh, this is 
uh, gotten quite a bit of attention. It's brought uh, a substantial amount of money into our, uh, into our bank account. Uh, people get all concerned about all that. We're being extremely careful and diligent to work through the process of evaluating each of the applications and uh, to proceed in what we think is a very sensible step. But um, at the end of the day, uh, there will be substantially more top-level domains in the route, and then we'll have to see what that impact is. But I think if you know, one steps back, and, and again, not too inwardly focused on just what we do at ICANN, but uh, look at it in the broader sense of uh, the full internet picture. It's a, it's a relatively small part of the uh, rather dramatic set of changes that are continuing to take place. Thank you. Um, this is probably addressed to Steve more than because tomorrow um, you're, you're, you, you, you have a meeting with the Prime Minister. Uh, have you thought of what you're going to say to her? Um, I'm looking forward to it because I understand that she is an extremely accomplished uh, business person and uh, uh, very dynamic. And so um, I, uh, I'm, I'm heading into this not so much from uh, with a perspective of uh, having a set of requests, but of uh, wanting to learn uh, what the world looks like from her point of view and uh, to see if there's any uh, insights into how to uh, foster more communication and more cooperation and uh, collaboration with this region. Okay. Gentlemen, we, we, if we, there are no further questions. We only have a couple of minutes left. Vin, some final thoughts and words for the 25th anniversary of, of, of the Internet in Thailand? Can we hear from you and then well, from, from Steve, please? Thank you for that opportunity. First of all, congratulations again. 25 years is really a big deal. And when I think of that being 1988, uh, when the internet begins to emerge in Thailand, uh, that's really quite striking. I think, Steve, when you meet with the Prime Minister, uh, one of the things you might um, bring up is the value and importance of internet to the development of small and medium-sized businesses and their ability to potentially reach outside of the Thai economy. Uh, to serve the rest of the world, which uh, is a much larger uh, footprint, a much larger market than the purely domestic one. Uh, and I hope very much that as Thai, uh, Thailand invests in Internet infrastructure and its use in education uh, and in business, that it will take advantage of this potential to reach around the world to deliver products and services uh, to others. Good. I, th there is an important thing to, to add. Uh, one of the areas that I've specialized in over the last uh, couple of decades is uh, security matters related to the architecture of the Internet. And indeed, one of the reasons why I was very pleased to accept the invitation to come here is because uh, THNIC, the .th, was the first uh, top-level domain in Asia to implement uh, DNSSEC, the security extension for DNS. Uh, in conjunction with the meetings that, uh, we've de that we've described, the celebration of the 25th anniversary of .th, uh, INET, uh, there is a DNSSEC training workshop starting tomorrow morning, three days, 300 people from around the region. This is extraordinary. These are the, uh, the people at the absolute center of the technical operations in ISPs, and in top-level domains and in other uh, related operations around this region, getting uh, uh, intensive training and exposure to a first-class set of experts who have come from all over the world to uh, provide this. This is building both uh, core capability, uh, capacity building is the term of art, and a community that it can draw upon each other. Uh, so that's... Uh, it will be the, um, uh, the more geeky, if you will, uh, activity of this entire week, but it may be the activity that has the most direct and enduring impact uh, in terms of improving security in this region. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, for me personally, it's been a pleasure and honor to speak to Steve and Ben. Uh, I'd like to thank you for, for, for participating in your attention. Could you please... Uh, a warm welcome, a warm thanks, sorry, for both gentlemen, the founders of the Internet.
Thank you very much. That was certainly a very fruitful and inspiring discussion.